Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kentucky Student Success Collaborative Impact Webinar, College Al Algebra Success Project. And the partners for today who's going to be with you are uh, the Kentucky Student Success Collaborative, KCTCS, uh, and Pearson. So our agenda for today will be as follows. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your time. This has been some a, a tremendous amount of work that has gone into this project, and we are really excited uh, to share some results and, and some other findings with you. So we are going to talk a little bit about the Kentucky Student Success Collaborative first uh, and give you some insights into the Gateway Core Success Strategy. And then we're gonna move directly into our College Algebra Success Projects. Um, findings and outcomes, experiences and lessons learned, and then we will wrap up. And so as you formulate your questions throughout uh, our time together, you will have an opportunity to put that into the Q&A. So uh, feel free to um, come up with those ideas, those questions, and we will be glad to entertain all of that towards the end of our time together. Okay, so many of you are very familiar now, um, after two years of establishment with the Kentucky Student Success Collaborative. Uh, I, however, am not Dr. Lily Massa McKinley. She is our executive director, and I'm very happy to fill in uh, her place today. Um, let's just say a prayer for her family as she is with them today. Um, and so I'm going to move us through our time together today. And again, I'm Phyllis Clark, and I serve as Associate Director for the Kentucky Student Success Collaborative. And I'll tell you a little bit more about my work in just a moment. But first, uh, for those of you who uh, are interested in more about what our purpose, our charge, and our vision has been for the Kentucky uh, Student Success Collaborative, wanted to share with you, um, our purpose really is to accelerate transformational change. You can see all of our keywords that are highlighted here on this screen. Um, but in terms of our purpose, you know, collaboration is it for us. That's why it's in our name. But with collaboration on strategic student success priorities, and the charge is to facilitate that collaboration, innovation, and impact through stakeholder engagement, design thinking, improvement science, and equity accountability principles. And lastly, we all have to have our vision, right? So higher education leads to social impact and makes a positive difference, we believe, in the quality of life of all Kentuckians in our Commonwealth. And to that end, we operate through uh, what a lot of people already know as the theory of change. And you can see the model to the right of your screen. Um, but let me just share a theory of change is the collaborative, collaborative efforts fail when there's no agreed upon process for working together. And we hope we've been um, good stewards of this process if we, as we have worked uh, with all of your institutions throughout the last two years. But through this ongoing stakeholder engagement, uh, the collaborative works with uh, campuses to co-create a statewide strategy for common student success priorities and challenges. And I think you already know uh, much of what those are. Um, through collaboration, we can know more, we can learn faster and scale quickly. And as Lily loves to say, we can accomplish more together than any of us can do on our own. So a little bit deeper into the collaborative in terms of our framework and our priorities. Uh, this is one of the first things that we did as uh, an established um, uh, organization uh, within our unit. Uh, we focus on the main areas that you see here. There are so many other things that we could have done, but we felt it was important uh, for Kentucky for us to pay attention to these things that you called our attention to. And so that is connecting the path where our focus is on transfer success, 
Um, and underneath that, we focus on admissions redesign, uh, as well as summer bridge and communities of practice that serve such. Um, charting the path is more on the aligned with academics in terms of our gateway core success. And I'm going to speak to that in another moment. But uh, also within that is the College Algebra Success Project, which we're going to outlay here for you in just another moment. Uh, thirdly, there is the continue the path, and that is uh, all of the work that you are already well aware of around student basic needs, uh, which also encompasses student, uh, I'm sorry, mental health. And then finally, completing the path, helping our students get from connecting the path all the way to completing the path. Now, this particular area is not uh, under the collaborative, but we work together. So Dr. Jenna Weiss leads this work. And um, underneath that is, you probably already know, are the 10 essential skills that a lot of our institutions are incorporating into their curriculums. Okay, so Gateway Core Success Strategy. Uh, I am leading that effort. I am honored to uh, work with a number of faculty and student success uh, professionals uh, who are deeply, deeply committed to helping our students um, uh, through this path. And so what we have done uh, over the last eight, nine months is to garner conversations that, you know, tell us what can we do as a state to help our students achieve in our in their milestone courses of English and math. And so all of those conversations resulted in the three areas that you see here. And the first one, we wanted to, or we will prioritize efforts related to strengthening communication and collaboration within and across institutions to promote better and more equitable outcomes in our gateway courses. Now, gateway courses, um, are those first year, you know, foundational type courses, we do not necessarily interchange with that. So throughout the conversation uh, today and uh, anything that you hear me talking about with regard to this, I'll be referring to everything as gateway course success. Number two, we're going to center students needs above all else in the pursuit of scalable improvements in gateway courses. Now, this has already morphed a little bit, and so we'll be coming out, and during my announcement, I'll talk more about it, um, but you're going to understand a little bit of the shift uh, that has already taken place since, uh, since this was presented. And then thirdly, we're going to focus on removing barriers to equitable access to and success in gateway courses across multiple modalities. And before we get into um, speaking more about the college algebra uh, success and the impact of all of that work, I quickly want to show you um, some of the emerging priorities related to the three objectives that were just mentioned. And so you can see quickly, um, we want to drill down uh, within each of these areas and give uh, priority to several things as it relates to each objective. So under objective number one, which is strengthening the communication, we're talking about developing a dashboard to track uh, disaggregated data on student enrollment and success in these courses across all of our institutions. Number two, convening a community of practice uh, to identify our best practices and uh, speak to strategies that work and, you know, understanding those that don't. Uh, three, developing uh, better messaging, comprehensive uh, messaging and uh, communication practices for our advisors and uh, for the students, emphasizing the importance and the value and the relevance of our gateway courses. Um, when you think about centering students' needs, you know, prioritizing the student voice in a qualitative way, um, we think is going to be of the utmost importance, but this has actually uh, morphed into something even stronger. And again, that'll be coming out here uh, in just a, another moment in a final announcement I'll share. Uh, we also want to promote evidence-based strategies that increase success, right? And the third one, promoting wraparound basic needs supports for students in Gateway and the co-requisite uh, support courses as well. And then lastly, removing barriers to us means conducting studies to determine the impact of various practices on student enrollment and success. 
uh, engaging colleges in redesigning instruction in some of these courses, which emphasize the role of the faculty. And then thirdly, providing professional development to help our faculty deliver uh, high quality, inclusive and culturally relevant instruction in our gateway courses. So that's just a little bit of what is coming and I'm excited to make a quick announcement. In fact, I believe that is the next slide. So let's look at that. Gateway Course Success Convening. We will be uh, having this on Wednesday, January the 31st, 2024. Please save this date. Uh, the day will be recognized as Gateways to Opportunity, a statewide vision for Gateway Course Success. And this will be held at the Kentucky Council uh, offices in Frankfurt. Our time together will be 10 to 3 uh, Eastern Standard Time, and we will send out information, uh, invitation, the links, and any other info that we think you need uh, on next week. Okay, so I would like to um, turn it over now to Kasha Miller and Jenna Matthews and Morgan Sluggins uh, to speak a little bit more about the College Algebra Success Project and all the great things that have happened uh, inside of that work. Kasha? Hello, so I'm Kasha Miller uh, from Bluegrass Community and Technical College. I'm currently the Assistant Dean of Student Success and Retention, a math professor and also a CPE faculty fellow. I have been working with Jenna Matthews from Pearson <laughs> for quite a few years now as this project got started as a local initiative and then kind of expanded. And Morgan Slugantz, whose camera doesn't work, but she's here. Morgan Slugantz is the fear guide that we've been working with. So she's a bluegrass student. Yes, hello. <laughs> You'll have to advance, Phyllis. All right, so just kind of an introduction of where this project came from. Um, back in 2020, 2021, Bluegrass worked with Pearson on developing a redesign for our contemporary math course. Uh, and Pearson provided some very um, background data that we don't normally have access to. So using that live assignment success and performance and engagement activity, we use that to direct our contemporary math course redesign within the Pearson product. Uh, but through the course of that, Jenna came and went, woo, <laughs> I may have found something, um, which is a new metric, which she'll explain a little bit more in the next slide <laughs> about a giving up trend. And that kind of prompted a secondary pilot where we could explore the validity of that trend as a statistical measure. Um, so we went ahead and continued with the pilot. This is when we brought Morgan on board as a peer guide. So we ran our original pilot with contemporary math in fall of 2021. And then we uh, continued with contemporary math and college algebra in spring of 2022. But about that time is when the Kentucky Student Success Initiative started or collaborative started. And so they heard about what we were doing in some of our initial data. So they turned around and said, let's make this bigger and see what happens. So spring 2022, we had a call for participants. We had eight colleges agree to participate. And so we ran our pilot of uh, the last academic year from 2022 to 2023. Take it away, Jenna. Thank you, Phyllis, for running the slides and the intro, and Kasha for the intro to this specific program. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing this metric that we were using. Uh, what we call it is um, giving up or problem abandonment. And the way we um, put together the data to look at this is we start by grouping student activity into sessions. And basically the rule that we use for that is anytime something happens within 30 minutes of something else happening, 
um, those get grouped together into a session. So as long as a student keeps working, the session just keeps going. When they step away for more than 30 minutes, um, then we look at the last time they did something and that's the end of their session. And when they come back, it starts the clock again and starts a new um, session timer. And within that session, we can see the different problems that students are working on and even some detail about how they're working on that problem. So we can see where they're asking for a hint or working through an example or even where they're um, submitting what they think the answer is and checking to see if they're correct. So using that, we um, looked at all of the problems and said that they have uh, that they gave up on a problem if they worked on it, but didn't solve it in that session. So they put in some effort, they tried, they checked their answer or got hints, um, but they didn't end up solving it before they walked away for more than 30 minutes. And once we have that at the individual problem level, then for a session, we can talk about the session giving up, where we take the number of problems that they gave up on or the number that are not solved and divide that by the number of problems that they worked on. And that gives us a percentage, <clears throat> excuse me. Using that percentage, there are several possible metrics that we evaluated. Um, these include the worst session. So if you can imagine like the worst day you've had at a job or in a class, um, this is basically the highest giving up that student has over the course of a term. We can also look at things like their average over the term or their most recent session. But the one that we landed on was the trend across three sessions. So we can see sort of a pattern of, you know, are they doing better or worse over the most recent set of time? Uh, Phyllis, if you'll go to the next one. Thank so you. this this is an overview of uh, just the overview of the different components in the project. So using Jenna's data from Pearson, again, this was directly related to Pearson MyLab product that uh, we were using, and it was common to all of these institutions. And even though there's a lot of data on the front side, Jenna is able to access data on the back side that isn't readily available to faculty. So we had a uh, project lead, Lily. Um, Jenna was our Pearson lead. I was the coordinator lead, and Morgan was the peer guide lead. So the eight participating institutions each identified a project coordinator and a peer guide. The focus was college algebra. However, since bluegrass had already started with contemporary math, we continued with contemporary math as well. We got weekly reports from Jenna. Um, again, the background information. So we got some student performance data, and then we also got that giving up trend. So we were looking for if a student was giving up on 50% of their problems, that pretty much was our indicator that maybe we would try some outreach. So we're trying to see if we can impact student behavior before they fail the test or before they fail the quiz. Maybe we could intervene and assist with that. So the coordinators would take the data, organize it, and that is what they would use to direct the outreach, which was done by our peer guides. Um, on the student success collaborative side, um, they gave us, uh, we have a college algebra community to practice for this, and they grade each institution a $3,000 grant to help fund peer guides. So all the peer guide part was funded. So goals, um, one of the background things, which is why it's nice to have a third party kind of involved, is that we wanted to know about the metric validity. Is this metric viable? Does it work? Is it valid? Um, it could potentially be a metric that could, again, help influence student success prior to performance on a high stakes assessment. Uh, so the real goal was truly leveraging Pearson 
data analytics, with peer outreach, with the ultimate goal of improving student success in college algebra, contemporary math, gateway math courses is how I looked at. And then finally, this was a after the fact goal. Well, next goal is, okay, since we're doing all this outreach and we're documenting all this outreach, when actually can we have the most impact on student behavior? Is there a window of time where you are going to receive the most bang for your buck in terms of increased student engagement versus that outreach, point of outreach? Jenna, did you want to add anything else? Um, just, I, I like that you called that out as an after the fact goal. This was one that we weren't we didn't even realize would be a possibility until we started collecting not just the activity data that's available on the Pearson side, but the outreach documentation that the peer guide teams um, kept track of so that we could see when that outreach happened and compare that to student engagement. So that um, that outreach documentation was a huge win for us with this goal. Moving on. Peer guides. Um, Morgan, you want to come talk about peer guides? <laughs> yes. Um, so my job as a peer guide, Kasha would give me a list every week of students, their math course, I would get their phone number, email, and she would specify how she wanted me to reach out, whether it was text, email, or phone calls. So I would call, check in on the students, see how they were doing and ask them about their math course. I was also in charge of training our other peer guides at our other campuses. And I would participate in monthly and sometimes weekly meetings with peer guides and Kasha and Jenna. And she helped, I don't want to disclude this, she helped write scripts. Script development was huge uh, because as a faculty member, um, we have a certain tone in our communications. <laughs> we come at communications with students from a different perspective. So taking what I wanted to say and having Morgan and the other peer guides kind of translate that into more student-directed language, I think was one of the most valuable things we got from this experience um, because she could really put it in context for us of how about we say it this way here? <laughs> and I think that went over very well. <laughs> that that actually touches on our why peer guides reasoning. Um, Kasha and I kind of joked with Morgan a lot that for for both Kasha and I, we see things from a teacher perspective and without even meaning to, we speak in teacher language. Um, and we really wanted a voice that was less intimidating um, from a local student at the same school. Uh, there was also earlier work with near peer mentors, um, which was showing some real promise um, with, especially with STEM courses and with underrepresented minorities or even um, even uh, like genders that are underrepresented in STEM fields. So having someone who can speak in a student language and a student voice was a really key part. And the other difference here is that although a couple of the schools did actually use an embedded tutor as their peer guide, the majority of us just had a peer guide. Morgan wasn't there to tutor, she was there to direct them to tutoring services or direct them to counseling services or advising services or say, hey, have you thought about this? <laughs> <laughs> so she she wasn't tutoring, but she was a connector. We wanted her to be the, the peer guides to be the connector between something's going on, let's have a conversation and have we considered these resources. Moving on. All right, so what we have here is a, a summary of some findings and outcomes. So we'll start with Jenna. Okay. 
we can go there. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first one I want to talk about, this is looking uh, at some historic data when we first started evaluating the metrics to determine whether this three session trend was a usable metric. So I want to just highlight some of the things that we found. Um, first, we found that a 1% reduction in giving up led to roughly a 2% increase in the student's predicted success. And when we look at this giving up behavior over the length of a semester, um, this graph at the top, you can see we divided it into a pass or what you all use as a success rate versus DFW. Um, but we also did it in the graph below based on like letter grades. And for both of these cases, you can see that these trend lines are very distinct. They don't cross each other, um, which means that there's a, a noticeable and persistent difference between students who pass the course and students who fail. Also a noticeable difference even among letter grades. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also did, um, and I just put the numbers here, not the messy statistical printout. Uh, we checked for the accuracy of this trend in predicting success, and we found that it was able to accurately predict um, passing the course for more than 71% of the students. We also looked at um, precision for students who are failing the course. This is basically looking to see how well uh, this behavior in the group of students that we're looking at matches what we would expect to find in the whole population. And we had an accuracy or a precision that was above 91%. So this behavior for the subset of students that we could look at historically uh, captures 91% of what we would expect to see for the population of all students who fail these courses. So this gave us some um, some confidence that this metric was a useful one to use for prediction. Uh, Phyllis, if you'd go to the next slide. Uh, the second part that we wanted to look at is how well or how far in advance it worked for prediction. And what we found is that we had sometimes a 30 plus day warning before students withdrew from the course where we could be 72% certain um, that we were predicting the behavior and that that prediction was highly significant. So for those of you who are math people, um, the R squared was 0.72 and the P value was less than 0 0.000. Um, so we use this to say, okay, not only is it reliable in the sense from the previous slide where it's a key differentiator and um, can accurately make predictions, but it also gives us a big window of time for those predictions. Um, as many of you are probably familiar, uh, the day before finals, it's pretty easy to guess who's going to pass and who's going to fail the course. But at that point, it's really hard, if not impossible, to make any difference in that metric at all. And for this, we were looking at weeks and sometimes more than a month where advisors, peer guides, teachers could reach out and make a difference and change what this was predicting. So that made it something that was really encouraging for us as well to use as a um, as a metric because we knew we had some time between when we saw this and when it had an unchangeable impact on students' behavior. Uh, thank you, Phyllis. We can go to the next one. And Kasha, do you want to take this or do you want me to keep going? Go for it. OK. Um, so the next thing we looked at, this was once we started collecting data about the peer outreach. <clears throat> And so what we wanted to see is um, we know this metric is useful, uh, it's reliable, and now we want to see if we can change it. So we looked at all of the student sessions and 
looked at what happened in their next session. So based on what we know on Tuesday, can we predict what's going to happen on Wednesday, for example? And looking at just all of the students, all of the sessions, we saw a 40% reduction in giving up or problem abandonment on their next session. So that means if nothing happens and nothing changes, they're not in a group getting outreach, then there's a 40% chance that the next session will look better than the current one. If they receive outreach from a peer guide, um, any kind of outreach, email, phone call, voicemail, text message, that jumps up to 45%. So we get that 5% gain just if they hear from a peer guide afterwards. And I'm not sure if this stayed in the slide, but um, that 5% gain, we are more than 99.9999% sure that it's caused by the peer outreach. So we've got a lot of confidence in that change. We had, as will probably not surprise any of you, a very small comparative number of students who responded to the peer outreach, either by texting or emailing back or having a phone conversation with the peer guide when they reached out. That led to another improvement, but it was such a small population that we're a lot less certain that that matters. So basically what we're getting from these, uh, you know, second and third lines here, if students receive outreach from a peer guide after showing this behavior, we see a 5% improvement and we're very certain that the outreach plays a key role in that improvement. If they respond to outreach, it helps even more, but we have so few students who respond that our certainty is a lot less with that one, um, just because the population size really shrinks. And again, this probably doesn't surprise any of you who have been advising or teaching for a while um, that we get a lot fewer students responding to the outreach than we send the outreach to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, then we also looked at course level success. So not uh, not an individual student's next session, but at the course level, the next session. So we could say uh, for the college algebra course section five, which I know is not how y'all number sections, um, we can see that uh, there's without peer outreach, we see about a 2% improvement overall. So students improved over students not improved in the next session. So this is at like the teacher course level. Um, we've got that 2% edge. But in the sections that have peer outreach actively going on, instead of a 2% edge, it's a 51% edge, where even if um, not every student in that section is receiving outreach. The fact that that section is part of the group that gets outreach from peer guides is having a, a big difference from other sections. Next. So here's that after the fact <laughs> data point. So based on all the data collection, because every peer guide outreach was documented, whether the student responded was documented, plus on top of the re-engagement data that Jenna was able to provide, um, she pretty clearly showed <laughs> that the first 10 days are key. If you're going to do peer outreach, if you actually want to change a student's behavior, then you need to be working with them and reaching out to them, preferably within the first seven days, but definitely within the first 10 days. Um, after we had some peer outreach, we had an 80% increase in student engagement, meaning less giving up, less problem abandonment, more active participation 
if we communicated within the first 10 days. But after that window, it dropped down to a 38% chance. And for those of us who teach, this probably makes sense. <laughs> but we have numbers now. Do you want to yeah. add anything, Jenna? <laughs> Just, I, I really like that call out. I, a lot of what we're talking about here today will make sense to those of you who, like Kasha and I, have been or are teachers. Um, what's nice about it is that this project especially gave us a lot of data that we could use to kind of test and back up those intuitions about how teaching outreach and its impact on student behavior could work. Next, tell us. So this was kind of an overview based on all the participating institutions looking at success rate. For all of this, we are defining the success rate as ABC, so that's important to note. Um, her first chart was a fall to fall and a spring to spring comparison of overall course success rates. So that's including participating sections and non-participating sections. Um, but she highlighted in the second chart um, three institutions in particular that were able to see a pretty significant increase. The gray bars are non-participating success rates of non-participating sections. The colored bars are the uh, success rates of participating sections. So by participating, that means these sections had the coordinator, they got the data from Pearson, and they had a peer guide doing active outreach. So we saw some pretty significant um, differences here. And basically to do like a high level summary for these three campuses where we could compare participating versus non-participating sections, because it was for an academic year, so two terms at three campuses, six terms, right? Um, out of those six terms in four of them, there was a significant noticeable difference where the participating sections really outperformed the non-participating sections. So that's, you know, two thirds of 66% success rate. That's pretty good. And we were very excited about it. Next. Um, so here I went and because Bluegrass has been doing this for two years, I had a little bit more data to work with. Um, so what you have on the left was an analysis of our contemporary math and our college algebra from spring of 2022, which is before the Student Success Collaborative Project. Uh, this was our best semester. <laughs> um, but in both courses, well, in the contemporary math, which for us is MA 111 year, our contemporary math, we saw a significant increase in success rates across the board, but also with participating sections over non-participating sections. Um, we saw a little bit of a gain in the college algebra for participating versus non-participating. It just wasn't as significant as for the contemporary math. Um, on the right-hand side is the actual success rates. Focusing on online, this project mostly started because we needed extra support for online. If you're on campus, you've got a teacher right there. If you're online, we just tend to get more disengaged. Um, we can see from the 16 week online, I went back to some or three semesters. So fall 2020 is our baseline, which yes, that's COVID, but you know, we gotta do what we gotta do. Fall 2020 is our baseline. So we saw a continual increase in fall success rates fall 2021, fall 2022 with this project. And so what you have there is the online success rates and then some comparisons. And then we compared spring to spring. So spring 2021 being our baseline and then spring 2022 and spring 2023. So this is just data. Um, you'll notice spring 2023, we saw a decline across the board. Like, I don't know what happened that semester, but 
we took a hit <laughs> right across the board. It happens. Um, prior to that, though, things were going okay. So I don't know. We'll know more once I get fall 2023 building. Next slide. This, however, I am happy about. <laughs> so I actually managed to go back and take a look at persistence rates. If you define persistence as a student that enrolled and attended the next term. So for fall, they enrolled in spring. For spring, they enrolled in summer or fall. And I did not bother with graduation. So if they graduated, they're considered a non-persister in this data set. I know there's different ways to do that, but I couldn't get to that level with data. So persistence rates. This is for college algebra and contemporary math combined. The first chart on the left is differentiated by on or by modality. So we had an on campus, if they participated, yes or no, and what their persistence rate was. For on campus and online, we had a significant increase in persistence. Um, remote, not so much. I can't tell you why, have no idea, just giving you the numbers. <laughs> um, but even combined, you can see that we do have an increase in persistence based on participation in this project. Uh, on the right-hand side is a little bit deeper dive into the two courses, the contemporary math and the college algebra. So the gray bars are persistence rates for individual terms for non-participants, and the orange bars are the persistence rates for participants for those individual terms. And we can see very clearly for both courses, for both terms, for online sections, which was, again, has been one of my personal priorities, for online sections, we see a clear increase in persistence rates from participating sections versus non-participating sections. So to summarize, we may not have seen a huge jump in success rates. Some did, some didn't. We can't guarantee a success in or a, an increase in success rates. But at least at Bluegrass, they kept coming back. <laughs> so we have an increase in persistence. Um, so I was, I'm happy about persistence. It's success and retention. So they both matter. I think this one makes a really great connection as well that I just want to. Uh, draw some attention to. Part of what we're looking at with this giving up metric is students that are working but not finishing, if you get a little abstract with it. And especially when we look at the trend, we're looking for students that are doing more working it but not finishing over time. So it really makes sense and is exciting to see that that rolls up into a bigger kind of, you know, impacting their working and continuing to work if they're coming back to the next term. And I just, I think that's really awesome. I wanted to call that out a bit too. Yeah, she hadn't seen that data prior to this. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right, we just want to take a couple minutes and kind of give you a, uh, some experience and lessons learned from different perspectives. So I'm gonna hand it over to Morgan for the next two slides to talk about the students and the peer guides. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned before, I was in charge of actually calling the students or contacting the students, whether it was text, email, or calls. Um, I can tell you the amount of students I had that were genuinely just so thankful for me reaching out was huge. I still get, you know, some messages, some reminders of students that were just so thankful for me reaching out. I did have some students that, uh, you know, did not want to be reached out to from their college. A couple students that would hang up, but I can say that the positive reactions far outweighed the negative. Um, Kasha, do you have anything else you want to add on this? No, we did give a survey out. Uh, we didn't have a huge response rate, but these are some excerpts that were taken from that survey. I put the mode of communication on there because I'm trying desperately to keep up with 
how to get a hold of our students. <laughs> so according to the ones who answered, they still prefer KCTCS email, although as an instructor, I really question whether they're checking it or not. So I don't know about this. <laughs> Huh. Next slide. Yes, thank you, Ms. Phyllis. And from our peer guides, um, I was the peer guide coordinator. So all of our peer guides I would meet with about once a month. I would also get messages from peer guides every week asking about specific situations with students, how they would, you know, how they should proceed. I would also help our peer guides come up with scripts and messages that they should be sending week by week. And this is part of a survey that we also sent out to our peer guides at the end of the semester. So this is just kind of an overview of, uh, we wanted to know how the students were responding to them. Um, you can tell we really didn't get a lot of responses, but most of the time they were very appreciative. Uh, the peer guides were did a lot of their own scripting um, and they tended to find that the shorter the message, the better. So I will go ahead and share that little tidbit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in general, this is what happened with the peer guides. And you can see most of their communications were via email as well. So a good, bad, otherwise. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. From the coordinators, I didn't actually have an opportunity to uh, get feedback from a lot of the coordinators, um, but from the ones that did respond, and I agreed with almost all of these as well from my own personal experience, uh, we're not exactly sure all the extra data analysis we had to do on the coordinator end that that amount of time investment was worth the results. Now, that can be debated. Uh, a lot of us did not see a significant increase in success rates, but I do encourage us to go take looks at other met metrics as well. Um, but we felt that the project overall had benefit, the concept of the peer outreach, the timing of the peer outreach, uh, was helpful. Um, we also did kudos. I don't know if we've mentioned that before, but we also had our peer guys send out kudos after a positive exam or a positive quiz. So not all of the interaction from the peer guides was, hey, you're in trouble or are you in trouble? It was, hey, good job. Things look like they're going well. So keep up the good work. You can do this. There was a lot of just positive messaging that we wanted to incorporate in as well. And I do think that has a positive impact on the students. We have we have data that supports that even from the Starfish Early Alert um, data sets about positive outreach. Um, it's also hearing from another person. Uh, the peer guide contact enhances that faculty contact. Um, the giving up trends was useful, but again, it, it would be nice, and that's what we're hoping, uh, that we get that statistic more readily available for the faculty themselves and that they can use it. So overall, data analysis each week was very time consuming. There were some people that had problems with the data sets. Um, you know, it's data and it's working through multiple systems with KCTCS, PeopleSoft, my labs. There was a lot of places for things to go wrong. Uh, also, if courses weren't on the same schedule or same scale calendar, there were some difficulties. We're not going to lie. <laughs> this wasn't a smooth sailing kind of thing. But um, by having the documentation, having the right peer guide was very important. And that connection, if we can keep find that connection between the peer guides, the faculty, the outreach coordinator, and the data analysis, if we can streamline that, then we can see potential for, for continued motion. And I'd like to add, so like Kasha said, there were definitely some, some challenges and hurdles as we were getting together the data and the reports. And um, the Kasha mentioned a goal with this would be to have 
this metric be more accessible to faculty. I just wanted to do a, a sort of quick shout out because this um, KYSSC project this expanding to eight campuses over the previous academic year was a huge, huge step for us to be able to make this something that could be more readily available because this was a, a learning curve, definitely. And I know even some of the people on this call are really familiar with some of the challenges we had with the data. But this was also the first experience we've had taking a new metric like this and testing it out across more than one campus at a time. So it was, you know, all of that learning curve time and even the frustrating moments were extremely valuable for us to be able to learn how to take something that worked in one place and be able to spread it out to additional campuses with different timelines, different assignment styles, all of those, you know, individual nuances that did make it tricky, but it also gave us this fantastic set of data and experience that let us learn how to take these ideas and get them to the point where they could be more accessible to more faculty. So I do want to say, um, that was fantastic, and I'm really grateful for the group's work with this. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is kind of a um, a summary of what we learned and, and how we can apply it moving forward. So regarding the peer outreach, um, it did have a positive impact on student engagement. He showed that it did have a positive impact on student persistence, at least on a small scale at BCTC. I can't promise for everybody else. No, we were able to assist with both academic and non-academic concerns from students. And we all know how important that is to help contribute to the wraparound services and removing student barriers. So that was a positive. Um, we, I know Bluegrass is going to continue with the concept of the peer guides and, and having a coordinator. We're probably going to change the data because we won't have access to the data. So we'll be basing it more on faculty driven data as student alert, you know, starfish early alert kind of data. But the concept of we see a problem, as soon as we see a problem, we have somebody reach out and try to connect with the student. That can be applied anywhere for any course, for any program, for anything, which leads to the window. We also now have a window. We know that that first week, those first seven to 10 days is very important. So if we can have our faculty submit those slides as soon as possible so that we can do outreach as soon as possible afterwards, that's how we're going to have the best opportunity to improve success rates, engagement, persistence, whatever the case may be, that's going to be our best opportunity. And then finally, Pearson, hey, they're discovering a new statistic, they're getting data, and with any luck, they'll be able to incorporate it into our faculty end, and that will allow all faculty to have access um, so that they can interact again. That time, that window of impact is so important. So the quicker we can get this data, the more consistently we can get this data and use it to help our students and provide the peer outreach is just can help everybody. So those that's my summary anyway of <laughs> lessons learned. Don't know if Jenna or Morgan want to contribute. Uh, I will just say, um, like I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, this project with the collaborative and the eight campuses has been a huge step getting us closer to be able to incorporate this metric into our products. And that's actually the part of this that I'm working on now is starting to work with our product teams to say, okay, we've, we've done this, we've tested it, we have years of data now across several campuses that we can show it's been useful. So now it's time to get it into our product so that it can be available faster and to more faculty. Um, there is a note on here, I'll just call out, um, 
because this can be something that helps uh, with other projects that the collaborative is doing or as you're looking at anything that you want to scale. Um, the more the courses have in common, the easier it is to scale something up. Uh, some of the challenges that we hit were things like um, some courses would have all the assignments due on a Sunday. Other courses would have it due on a Monday. That meant that Monday reports didn't work for some of the coordinators because that was right before their cutoff instead of right after. We also found um, challenges with things like different names for tests or different cadences for um, courses or timelines. So as you're looking at other projects and trying to see how to scale something that's worked at one institution or for one course, having that in mind of, you know, the more things we can get in common across these courses, across these campuses, the easier it is to scale something up because it just makes it that much easier to have the same process the same data, the same cadence work across the board. There's a question about the, did the peers who do the outreach service tutors, the majority of the answer was no. They were peer guides who directed students to tutors. In a couple of institutions, they did use embedded tutors though. That was for Carrie. Um, if you do have any questions, I know we're running out of time here. Um, feel free to email <laughs> anybody. <laughs> Jenna, myself, um, we're 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 available. And happy to talk about it. This has been a really, really awesome project. All right, Phyllis, take us home. <laughs> All right, that was wonderful information you all shared. It made me think about a quote and if I can just slip it in here really quickly and it just states that if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. If you've come to help me because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. <laughs> and you all have worked together. What an impactful project, thank you. Um, so much for all of this sharing. That quote is by Leela Watson. Some of you might already know uh, that or know her. Um, so this, uh, we just wanted to share quickly what's coming up from the KYSSC, aka the Collaborative, our mental health community of practice on November the 30th. And we've uh, put all of the links here for these things. And you can go to our website at Kentucky um, Student Success dot org and go to our events page and you can see all of this again uh, if you're not able to to do it here and now. Um, career exploration and early onboarding webinar. I'll be facilitating that on Friday, December the 1st with Complete College America and three of our Purpose First institutions. Um, so please come back to that if you are able. And then I will be leading our co-requisite community of practice next week. Uh, student basic needs community practice coming up and our gateway course success convening on January the 31st. All of this exciting stuff coming up and I hope you or your uh, designees um, or your campus teams are able to um, participate uh, in any and in, in all of this really this is us this is for us this is by us. Um, so again, thank you. I believe that is our last slide. I will take a quick peek here to make sure. Got one more. Okay. Ta-da! Yay, the biggest one of all. <laughs> the Student Success Summit. I think everyone is aware when we typically host this, February 26th and 27th, and we'll be down at Western Kentucky University. Um, our theme this year, uh, is partnerships that work. This is going to be so great. I've seen all the things behind the scenes and all of the amazing uh, national speakers, regional speakers, local speakers, and uh, this is going to be something to remember. So early bird registration is open right now. You can uh, get access to this link if you have questions, um, 
need additional information, feel free to get in contact with us. I think you know how to get to our website. Many of you already have my name and email as well as Lily. Um, feel free to reach out uh, to any of us at any time. And so that concludes, I think we are one minute over. I was hoping to give time back, but that concludes our impact webinar uh, on the College Algebra Success Project. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you.